I feel like everything we did in those days was really, really sped up. Like we wanted to book those first shows immediately. We all, you know, we wanted to get in the studio right away. So we booked a bit of studio time in Niagara Falls. We kind of just started. We had enough songs that we could play like, you know, five or six songs at a show. And we knew we wanted to make a demo. We went to a place called Burning Sound, a little basement recording studio in Niagara Falls. And our drummer at the time, Jesse, he, uh, we took all his math notes uh, from school, which he was never going to use. And we took, uh, we took all those and we wrapped every single CD in a different page of his, of his math notes. And, hand signed them and numbered them and sold them for like, you know, two or three bucks at shows. Alexa on Fire self-titled was recorded at probably nine or ten different studios all around Toronto. It was kind of like a real Frankenstein recording in that we like recorded half of it, you know, in an actual proper studio. We did like the drums in a proper studio and then we brought it to like this writing room at EMI Music Publishing. Our friend Greg, he worked there as like the engineer and so he could get us free studio time. Hey, I've got some free time from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. You guys can come in and track guitars. I think the highlight of it was just the fact that we were making a record, you know? It was cool. I mean, everything was new. Everything was exciting. We were just really going for it. It did exactly what, what we hoped it would do. It gave us another platform to go and tour, which is all we wanted to do. The cover comes from the idea when we were playing, I feel like, all the flyers for shows at that time. They had this description of the band under the name, like in brackets, you know, so, you know, whiskey tinged metalcore from upstate New York. Buffalo metalcore, or punishing D beat from Syracuse. Gasoline soaked Texas hardcore, or something like that. And we'd be like, say, two Catholic schoolgirls in a knife fight which I don't know what that sounds like. I don't think anybody really does, but you can imagine. And that's sort of kind of what I think we sounded like, to be honest, just a bunch of shrieking. I had it in my brain. I was like, okay, let's do this. Let's get like a couple of, let's find some girls. We'll get some plaid skirts and we'll give them knives and we'll take some pictures of them on a baseball diamond having it out. And, uh, and that became the album cover. <laughs> We had these tours coming up, and I remember it was kind of like the choose between going to art school and then and then or being in the band. And I remember a seasoned veteran of the music industry like sitting down with me and being like, "Look, kid, your worst case scenario with this is you're either going to be a 25-year-old freshman, or you your best case scenario is you." getting a successful band, so why don't you just put off school for a while and go do it? I guess our first real tour would have been during my March break. At high school, we went across the states for two weeks. Wade had met this guy online, and he offered to book us a tour, and of course we you know, said yes, not knowing any details or anything, not even knowing if we were gonna actually get paid or if the shows were gonna happen. And it was that network of you know, kind of independent scenes. You're playing in like an art space or a basement or, you know, like a hall. And, uh, and yeah, that was the first tour across America. Really fun tour, um, really strange tour. Our van broke down on the way to the first show. And we had to get towed back, cancel two shows, and then we rented a van and came back. I think that was like one of many things that happened along the way that could have been terribly demoralizing and could have, uh, probably killed the band, but we were all always very resilient. We slept in Queens, New York, uh, the first night in front of the promoter's house. Like, and I think he lived with his parents. So it was like, he, we couldn't come into the house, but he'd let us park in front of the house. At one point in the night, this guy with tattoos, this bald guy came out and like rapping on the window and he's like, what the hell are you guys doing here? And we're just like, Jesus Christ, you know, like, oh, you know, we're just trying to like, you know, open the door, you know, and, like finally someone opens the door and this guy's just like, no, I'm a cop. Yeah, I live over here. Why are you guys sleeping in this van or whatever? And it was just, we had to explain the situation. This guy, Jimmy's putting on a show for us in Long Island and he's letting us sleep over here. He's like, oh, okay, all right, you know, and he let it happen, but yeah, there was some tense moments. That was the first tour. That was our first experience of going on the road, and yet we still kept doing it. The first video we made was for pulmonary archery. 
I remember getting the call saying that we were getting a video fact grant, which is like they give you $20,000 to make a music video. At the time, $20,000 was like a million dollars. Like it was like, like we'd never seen any sort of money like that ever. Again, it was a, something that was totally new. The idea of, uh, I remember there being a makeup guy there and us the most alien concept ever. We spent all the money on film. We had Mark Riccardelli take us into this weird house, this mansion kind of thing in, in Toronto, and we set up in a room and we played for like 12 hours straight. None of us had ever done anything like that before, so we were excited when we got there, but nine hours later when we heard the song, you know, a thousand times, and at the drop of a hat had to get up and act like we were playing it for the first time becomes something that you don't want it to be, you know? But again, that video did so much for us. It started getting played a lot, which is really crazy. And I know Steel's not here today, but I will say that Steel was working at Blockbuster at the time and he couldn't get the day off work. So they actually fired him for making the pulmonary archery video. He actually ended up getting scheduled to work the next day, but he was he was up in Toronto still. And they fired him because he missed his shift. Uh, and that was back when we all had jobs, you know. Just because you're in a band and you have a record and you have a music video doesn't mean that you're paying the bills. I know, that it was a good video and, and it was what it was and people liked it and made, a lot of people went to bat for us after that. I think too the fact that it was, it got played on TV was very surprising to all of us because none of us, I mean we all liked the band and we liked the songs. But none of us thought that anyone would listen to it or let alone play the video on the on, on TV. We toured a lot on that record. I graduated high school by this point. We hit the road like the day I graduated tour. So um, I think we got better at playing our instruments because we played every single day. You know, we played probably at least 300 shows a year. When we made the first record, we were just a bunch of kids trying to be in a band. And then by the time the Alexis, the Alexis on Fire tour schedule had, had finished, we were a band. <laughs> 